All right, well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians 4. We're going to begin by reading verses 2 through 6. We'll be looking at a couple of these verses tonight. So I'll begin reading Colossians 4, beginning in verse 2. So continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is God's word that we will come right back to after we pray. So let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ, because that mystery, the mystery of Christ has been revealed to us. We may still be, well, while there is much more to learn, that our finite minds are not capable of even grasping even how great our depravity is. Father, we are grateful that you have shown us that we are at enmity against you. We are aliens and strangers to you and to the place where you dwell. But through the blood of Christ, we have been brought near We've been brought into the kingdom. And so now we have you as our God. And we are your people. And so, Father, tonight we come to you asking that your spirit would enlighten our minds and show us these truths that are in your word. I pray that we would be discerning and wise would be transformed by the Word, that Your Word would take root in our hearts, captivating our minds and affecting how we live. So, Father, do a work within us through Your Spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. It's through His blood we come to You. And we pray this all for Your glory. Amen. So over the past few weeks, we've been considering the church's responsibility one to another. Um, and then we talked about the church's task to be light in a world of darkness. That's what we talked about last week. Um, we have those illustrations in Scripture of the you know, really the church being a city set on a hill that can't be hidden. We see that illustration that Jesus uses about not putting our light under a basket, but the light is meant to be placed on a lampstand for all to see. And so we, we, we've talked about these things. We've talked about the, our relational ministry one to another and then our responsibility to a watching world. And so as I was preparing last week, um, I was really I was reminded of these verses in Colossians 4, and I thought it would be helpful for us to dig into these verses um, as we've been considering the church and our responsibility to one another um, and our mission to the world. In this passage, there's three major topics. Um, there's prayer, there's the gospel, and our speech. Um, these topics, I believe all of them are worthy of our time, so um, I don't know that I'll do them consecutively. We might have some other devotions coming in the midst of this, but my intent is to go through Colossians 4 and look at the, these three topics, prayer, the gospel, and then our speech. So tonight we'll consider prayer. Um, but before we get there, it's always helpful to build context. Um, this will matter more towards the end. We'll draw this back. But you hear Tommy, myself, hopefully you, you get tired of hearing us say this because that means you've heard it enough. But in context is so important. <laughs> so 
context, if, if we don't have context, it's so easy to misinterpret, misunderstand the scriptures. So, well, let me back up and just the reason why it matters is because we often have the tendency to read our Bibles unlike we read any other book. We read our Bibles, we look at a verse or two, and then we wonder why we don't understand. Why are we misinterpreting these scriptures? Why don't we get it? Well, we don't read any book that way. That's not the way you would open up a book you've never read. I I hope not. You don't just typically open a book and just jump to the middle of the book and read a couple of sentences and then expect to know what's going on. You don't approach any literature that way. And so we shouldn't avoid that approach when we think about the Bible. So here, what I want to do is really paint the picture of where Paul is um, more so than what's going on in, in the letter. I'll give a general brush stroke, but I think the, the context of where he is, the situation will help us as we consider this letter. So as we think about Colossians, this is one of Paul's prison epistles. Um, The other epistles that were written around this time are Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon. And so Paul wrote these letters most likely between A.D. 61, 63, while he's imprisoned in Rome. Due to his current predicament, you'll see him say things like this, I am a prisoner of Christ, that's in Ephesians 3.1, or I'm an ambassador in chains, Ephesians 6.20. Colossians, he does the same thing as he closes the letter in verse 18. He says, remember my chains. And then as we'll see tonight, he says, it's Christ on account of the mystery, this gospel that he's in prison in verse 3. So there's other references to this imprisonment. But you get the idea. Paul is literally a prisoner for Christ. Um, He's not just saying that figuratively. He is saying that literally. He's literally imprisoned. He's literally locked up because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he uses this imprisonment. He uses the time that he has to then follow up with these churches that he's been involved in. Uh, Whether he was involved in in the plant of the church or just the strengthening of the church, he uses this time while he's, I mean, essentially, you know, can't go anywhere, he used this time to write to these churches to encourage them and to provide exhortation. So that's what he's been doing with Colossians. He he lays out, you know, really a gospel framework, reminds them who God is, talks about their relations one to another. And then as we come to chapter four, what we see Paul doing is he encourages and exhorts the church to pray. I mean, look at verse 2 in chapter 4. This is right after talking about these relationships that we're in. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. I mean, this verse really begins with the directive to continue in prayer. Some of your translations might read to be dev- or something like be devoted to prayer. And then what you'll see right after he says, continue in prayer, be devoted to prayer, right after that he adds a participle, really explaining a little bit, saying being watchful in it. So be watchful in it. So this directive to be devoted to prayer, to continue steadfastly in prayer, is then, I would say in some ways modified, added to with this expression of the need to remain watchful in it. As I read this, I was reminded of really a common objection that I think many of us have uh, whenever we pray. And this is, you may have said this, I have a difficulty praying because my mind wanders. That might be true of you. I'm I'm sure it is true of many of you. And you would say, well, it's hard to pray because I can't focus. Too easily distracted when I pray. Well, God's Word speaks to this. I mean, just think about it. If prayer came just naturally for us, then this directive to be watchful in prayer would not be here. But this directive is here because prayer can often or sometimes seem tedious and burdensome. As many of you know, I've been reading a lot of literature in 17th century England from Christians and in that time, and a common theme that they write about are to beware of the devil's devices. 
For instance, Benjamin Keach, he wrote a book titled The Progress of Sin or The Travels of Ungodliness. And the idea um, in this book, he talks about, you know, how sin goes. And I mean, it's, it's figurative, it's allegorical, um, but he's making a point about how sin goes around knocking at the door. And, and it's not something that he literally believes that way, but how sin gets in and takes root. And he believes in original sin. So it's, like I say, you got to take it as you will, but, but how sin takes, takes up within us. And one of the things he talks about in there is how sin in us, the sin in us, the, the war within us, that it causes us to think about other things when we should be at prayer, to cause our minds to wander, consider a thousand things rather than being devoted to God. And so Keach warned Christians against giving allowance to sin. Therefore, he exhorted Christians to flee sin, to flee temptation, and to live godly lives. And intricately woven into this godly life is a life of prayer. Um, What I like about Keach is he does not only exhort adults to do this, to, to flee sin and to be devoted to God, but he warns children against spending your days in trifling vanities when the earliest days of one's life are the best days to spend in the service of God. At one point, he references a young boy who, instead of being at play, devoted himself to God's Word and to prayer. So if this is your objection, if your objection is, my mind wanders, I just can't focus on God, If you have troubles with this, first of all, heed Colossians 4.2. Devote yourself to prayer by and being watchful in it, because it is easy to be distracted. But not only that, what we see here, I think the ending of this really helps us. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So giving thanks to God. I mean, one reason our minds wander in prayer is because we lack gratitude. We begin to feel entitled instead of being grateful for all that we have. I mean, did you realize, and I hope you do, and I'm sure you do, but maybe you need to be reminded, did you realize that everything you have comes from God? Not one thing. You didn't bring one thing into this world. You didn't decide, you know what, I'm going to be this type of person. I'm going to have this type of mind. I'm going to have this type of, of, of what, likes and interests. You didn't Decide what your mind would be like, what your physical body would be like. God created you, formed you, every part of you. The talents, the strengths that you have are God-given. That which you do not have, that you wish you had, that you maybe covet in others, those things, God created you that way for a purpose. Not one thing we have comes from us. Even the air we breathe comes from us from God. Therefore, we have much for which to be thankful. If not for God, we would all cease to be in the next millisecond. So one remedy against mindlessness in prayer is thanksgiving, as we see in this passage. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Another remedy against mindlessness and distractions, this is a a more practical remedy, is maybe to write out your prayers. Being one way to be watchful is to create, you know, practices that help you, and one way is to write out your prayers. Paul says, be watchful. So as being watchful, we know there's many temptations to distract us. And so I say one way to help with that distraction is maybe put pen to paper. Or I guess fingers to keyboard, whatever you want to do there. But this can help you focus on what you're praying. And it's a great reminder when you look at form, like past prayers, it can be helpful to see both how God has answered those prayers and how He's matured you through your life. The things you pray about, hopefully as we mature, we'll see maturity in our prayer life. Another remedy here is to be realistic as to how you approach prayer. Instead of Sometimes, and for some of us, we may not be able to do this. Maybe we can't focus for long periods of time on prayer, and we therefore expect to spend, you know, uh, minutes, hours, whatever it might be in prayer, and we find that we can't do it, and we fall short. Well, I would argue 
that you should consider devoting your day to prayer. Not 24 hours, but while there's nothing wrong with spending a chunk of time in prayer, I would say most of us aren't, don't have the luxury for that. Most of us, it's a struggle to do that, but make it a point to pray as you go. Pray throughout your day. I mean, the Thessalonians passage about praying without ceasing, the idea is not just one long prayer for, for all, every waking hour. The idea is a life of prayer, continual prayer. So be watchful. Be devoted to prayer. Much more could be said here, but one recommendation is this. Um, Eric Malstead, his book study that he's doing is on Michael Reeves' book called Enjoy Your Prayer Life. Um, Eric, he plans to talk about more than, than or he, he plans to do more than just talk about prayer. He plans to apply that which the book speaks to. So I would recommend his study. So that's what well, we have here, the, the, the first verse of this passage continues, steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, with the time that remains, I want to focus on two more objections. We've hit this first objection, my mind wanders, I have distractions. I want to hit two more objections pretty briefly. We'll, we'll walk through them pretty quick. So the first objection is this, God is sovereign. What does it matter if I pray? Second objection is, I don't know how to pray. I mean, I don't pray because I don't know what to pray about. So we'll look at both of these, like I say, pretty quickly. Um, The first one, you may have thought it, you may have said it, you may have heard others say it, but God is sovereign, so what does it matter if I pray? God's going to do what He's going to do. He doesn't need my prayer. A couple considerations here. First and foremost, this is not the example that we find in Scripture Nowhere in the Scriptures do we find any teaching like this. In fact, what do we find? We find, think about the example of Jesus, the example He sets for us. God in the flesh, what does He do? He prays to the Father. And then we see not only examples of prayer, but then we see exhortations to prayer, like the one we have here in Colossians 4 too. Paul doesn't say, you know, God's sovereign, you don't need to pray. He says, continue. He, this is a directive. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. We have exhortations to pray. The exhortations and examples undermine this objection that prayer is useless because God is sovereign. In Scripture, we learn that God hears our prayers and He answers our prayers. You see, this this objection is rooted in a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty along with a misunderstanding of our responsibility. So think of it like this. Because God is sovereign, we ought to pray to Him. Maybe we don't understand why. That's okay. We're finite beings. Our our capacity to understand is limited. But we ought to do as God commands us to do. His commands are for our good. And as we follow Him, one thing I've found in my life, that's when I begin to understand. Oftentimes I get to understand, the understanding comes as we submit ourselves to God's Word. Next objection, the last one we'll consider, is this. What should I pray? Or I I just don't know what to pray about. Well, here's my simple answer. Look to the Scriptures. In the Bible, you will find examples of prayer. You'll find exhortations about prayer. And you will find more than just general exhortations. You will find what we're going to look at here in verses 3 and 4 specific prayer request. I mean, look, let's look at verse 3. Paul writes, at the same time, pray also for us. And then he says, then he asks, this is what I ask you pray for. Pray that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Remember, so what we see here, Paul's in prison, and he's praying. He's saying, pray for us. Pray for us. And he doesn't say, pray for us that that God will let us out of prison. I mean, I think that's amazing what Paul's prayer is. It's not, hey, pray that we'll get out. 
It's pray that God will open a door for the Word so that we might declare the mystery of Christ. We'll talk more about that next time, but for tonight, let's just summarize that as the gospel, that God will open a door for the gospel. Paul says, pray, pray that we would have opportunities to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim Christ. And he says even more, that I may make it clear, that I would have clarity, that the gospel would go forth with clarity. And he says, that's how I ought to speak anyhow. And so, as Paul is praying, he says, or as he's, as he's given a prayer request, he says, pray that we'd have opportunity to pray the gospel. And as we do, that we, would, that we would proclaim that gospel with clarity. I mean, going back to the 17th century again, clarity was one of the major tenets of Puritan preaching. They desired clarity over intellectual acumen. They sought to preach the gospel so that all could clearly hear and know what it is they're either believing or rejecting. And now here Paul prays for clarity, that the gospel would go forth with clarity, that his words would not be an obstacle for his hearers. So as we draw this all back together, what we have here in verses 3 and 4 is an example of a prayer request, an example of how to pray. Maybe we want to apply that to our own lives or about the lives of others who who preach the gospel to, to the church, to missionaries that we know. These are ways we can pray. And then we don't just stop here, but we look at other examples in Scripture that give us directives and give us examples of how to pray. If you need a resource for this, there's a good book. Don Whitney, he wrote a book titled Praying the Bible. What he does, he he actually works through the Psalms a little bit in there, but what his whole purpose of that book is, is to teach you how to pray what is in the Scriptures. So, let me close with Paul's exhortation one more time. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we consider this topic of prayer, I hope that we are reminded of our dependency on You. We pray because we need You. We pray because we are finite, and we're those who are being renewed day by day. We need you to work in us, both to will and to do. And so we come before you now as we will spend the next part of our time together in prayer. And I hope that we're encouraged of our need to pray both corporately and personally and privately. So help us, guard our minds. Might we develop practices and habits that would help us to to keep from wandering and our thoughts, getting lost in our thoughts. Even help us to be disciplined, to, to get good rest so that we don't fall asleep when we're praying. Help us to remember that your word is what we adhere to, not what we think is logical that might be totally against or contrary to your word. And Father, I pray that we would look to your word to even know how to pray, to know what to pray about. May your word guide us even in the very prayers that we offer up to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Corey. I was thinking about the gratitude in prayer. Uh, Corey had uh, recommended a book for me to read. I was re- I'm reading a book uh, by a Secret Service man, uh, Clint Hill. He's, it's called Five Presidents. He served under Eisenhower all the way to Ford. I haven't got to the end, but to Ford. And just a couple of times, you know, he's constantly, he was on the president's detail a lot, 
but a few times in his long career as a Secret Service man where the president invited him to sit down, either in the Oval Office or in his home, and how much he cherished those times of just after protecting these guys, they would stop finally, and it wasn't a professional relationship. It was now a personal relationship. And as you're talking about gratitude, it just kind of pierced me, my heart, that God invites us, the creator of the universe, we have an audience. We have an invitation, and uh, we ought to be grateful that, would you say, because he is sovereign, we ought to pray to him? We have this invitation to come to the one who is sovereign and share the burdens of our heart and uh, pray for each other and for ourselves and our families. And I just... Uh, the gratitude and the, uh, I think my tendency to take it for granted that I have this opportun- uh, that I have this great opportunity any time to come. Okay, we have a question from the sermon Sunday. We're in Daniel four. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. Um, The question is, uh, in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar is reciting the vision. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. So the question is, who or what is a watcher? Uh, Uh, Verse 17, the sentence, uh, you know, the the, uh, vision is given, the tree is big and influential in providing uh, care for man and beast, and this tree is going to be cut down, there's going to be a stump left, and uh, verse 17 says, the sentence is the decree of the watchers the decision by the word of the holy ones. And uh, then in verse 23, as Daniel is uh, called in to interpret it, verse 23, and because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, and he recites the uh, uh, vision also before the, he gives the interpretation. So, Uh, In verse 17, it mentions the decree of the watchers. Were they the authors of the decree? And um, this question was also ended with, I believe that the book of Daniel may be the only place in Scripture that watchers are mentioned. And that's true. These three verses are the only place this word is mentioned at all. If we go to an Aramaic dictionary or a... If you're in, like me, you can't read Aramaic and you couldn't find a dictionary of Aramaic language anyway. Uh, my commentator said that uh, uh, this w- word watcher uh, is defined as a wakeful one, or it is also a noun form of to rouse oneself or to be awakened. And so uh, if we think about that and the watcher who came down from heaven uh, is one to awaken, well, that happened. He awakened Nebuchadnezzar, so he did his job with bringing the message that he brought. Uh, In my Old Testament background commentary, here's uh, a description of the watchers. It's only these three times in the Bible, but it's a well-known class of supernatural being in intertestamental literature, so the Apocrypha in between the Testaments, the Book of Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls in particular. Now, we're not going to take our theology from that, but uh, these watchers were mentioned often in the intertestamental time, after the 3rd century B.C., so after the 200s B.C., it almost always talked about fallen angels. 
But back in Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's day, 5th century, 6th century B.C., uh, it could be a variety of protecting spirits or demons. It could be good or bad. Angels. The, the New American, if you use a New American Standard Bible, all three of these verses say, puts angelic watchers. So it adds that word angelic before it. And I don't, if you know how the New American will add a word every so often to, uh, expl- to try to help us understand maybe this word watcher, but it's an interpretation that they add angelic watcher. So they say, the, the, the New American translators would uh, lead us to believe these watchers are angels, uh, or, or at least angelic uh, watchers. There's not really a textual reason to put that word in there, but they think they're helping us through that. Um, So I saw in the visions of my head, verse 13, as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. So this is a prophecy about a man uh, who will lose his kingdom, and he'll lose his mind for seven periods of time that we saw. Uh, So uh, uh, the watcher also, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers. And Daniel says the same thing about these watchers as he recites it. Only the, it's, it, it's a vision of the tree, but it becomes a vision about a man. And in that, as Daniel interprets it, the tree you saw, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. And so it was about Nebuchadnezzar and his seven periods of time where he loses his mind. Here's what I wrote, and I'm sure Corey's going to help us with this. So all we know from the text about the watchers is they're holy ones who've come down from heaven proclaiming a decree or proclaiming a message. It says the decision by the word of the holy ones or the decree by the word of the holy ones. So a a decree is only going to be from God, ultimately, right? Because only God can say something, and we can be sure it's going to happen. And this decision is by the holy ones, the decree by the holy ones. It's, and now this is me adding an italicized word like the New American guys did. So it seems that they're, the God is the author of this message message, this decree, and the watchers come down and declare the message or the decree that, that God has made. And we know when it's a decree from God, it's going to happen. And it did happen. Daniel's interpretation, it did happen. So I'm going to say they're angelic-like. The coming from heaven, holy ones, interpreting or bringing a message, um, it reminds me of Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. We, we, we see him and we'll see him in the visions in uh, the second half of Daniel. He explains a vision in chapter 8. He, he then, as Daniel's praying, Gabriel comes and gives insight and understanding and then gives him the vision of 70 weeks that we will get into. Gabriel also comes to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, and declares to him that uh, his barren wife is going to have a son who will be the one who will prepare the way of the Lord. And then Gabriel also comes to Mary and tells her she'll be the mother of Jesus. So this, this coming from heaven, Gabriel um, delivering a message to uh, of important uh, events. Uh, that seems to be what these holy watchers are doing. And then also we have Michael, the archangel. We meet him in Jude uh, when, the, when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses. 
Uh, he didn't even speak. It says the point is he's the archangel. He's the chief of the angels. And yet he wouldn't even speak to the devil. He said the Lord rebuke you. Uh, he, had, he, he essentially spoke to the Lord and had the Lord rebuke the devil. We have so many people who are going to rebuke the devil on your own. You're no match. Let the Lord do that rebuking. And then maybe Michael also possibly the voice of the archangel uh, and the sound of the trumpet will happen when the dead in Christ will rise. And that's the only, other, only two times the word archangel is used. So that's probably Michael. So I just kind of came to the conclusion that these watchers are angelic type beings come from God to deliver messages uh, to people, to us people who uh, are on earth. Corey, you want to? Um, I don't have much to add, but the Greek Septuagint, it, they translate it as angel. So they do, they, they translate it as angel. Did, but that doesn't mean it's right because they did yeah. that, but they did that. Um, this dictionary of biblical languages has two things, an angel that delivers a communication from God and a class of supernatural being with similar functions as an angel, but also distinct from them. Um, I don't know on that, but I mean, the angel, the messenger seems to be pretty standard, that idea. Yeah. So I don't have much to add there. So I, I just, here's my summary. God's intermediaries, God's means of relaying important messages or decrees at particular mentioned times. Uh, did they do it more often, and then they're they just not mentioned? I don't know. But be careful. You might be entertaining angels unawares. Be hospitable. All right? Okay, now, Corey, you got a question. Um, I don't Corey know came with a question. Um, let's see. When I listened to your sermon um, this week, you quoted Calvin. Yes. He said you, you didn't quite, I can't remember your exact words, but you don't quite agree, you couldn't quite go with Calvin, who said, therefore, in a word, I interpret repentance as regeneration. Could you expand on yeah. that? Okay, so, yes, Calvin says, therefore, and, and there's context there, but he says that he uh, considered repentance, turning from our sin, and regeneration the same, right? I mean, that's what you read in his institutes there. So, and, and I said, I don't quite buy that. I said that you won't have one without the other, but there are distinctions. Uh, and so Corey and I, Corey brought this up, and so we started talking about the doctrines of salvation, plural the doctrines that are involved in our salvation, our complete salvation. Um, you want to... Just looking at the rest of even Calvin, I mean, he's talking about, I mean, and I don't know if he even means exactly what he says there. I mean, I, I don't know that he actually means <laughs> We're that. Gonna, yeah, we know he didn't mean what he said, right? <laughs> because he goes on to say how this restoration, this new life, leads to a life of repentance that is, I mean, a daily life, uh, you know, that that's what it, I mean, just reading him in context, I mean, I don't, I wish he wouldn't have said those words because that's definitely not, that's not <laughs> helpful, but he doesn't talk about it in that way. I mean, he doesn't equate the two and he's talking here. He, he, you know, has the importance of new birth, new life that, you know, without that new birth, there is no repentance. There is no yes. new life. And so that's what it looks like Calvin's doing here. He just said an unfortunate phrase there. That's why we don't write books for that reason. Certainly not a 1,500-page <laughs> book. There would be too many errors in that for people yes. to pick out, right? Yeah. Yes. So we're talking about the doctrines of salvation, um, where... Uh, we There's so much confusion, you can walk up to any people many people on the street and ask them, are you saved? And they might say, yeah. And then you begin to ask them, well, well what are you saved from? Uh, what do you mean by being saved? And there's a lot of confusion about people who don't, they don't know the gospel. They don't know what, 
uh, the doctrines of salvation. So we, uh, uh, we think about these doctrines and in in, in they're all tied together because if, you're, if you become a Christian, they're all uh, part of what you believe. Maybe you don't know uh, them at, at very, we know them at various levels, but let me just read some of the, or just, I, I made a list of the doctrines of salvation. One would be in the eternity past, election is part of the doctrine of salvation. God, uh, before the foundation of the world, if you're a Christian, God chose you before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1. Um, that's part of the big, uh, salvation is the umbrella, right, of, of being a Christian. But these doctrines are distinct, and yet they go hand in hand. Um, regeneration, being born again. Well, if you're born again, you'll repent. You'll turn from your sin. You'll turn to God, and you'll put your faith in Christ. But regeneration is different from repentance. Regeneration is in, in, in something that happens in our heart, where God, the heart of stone gets plucked out, according to Ezekiel, and the heart of flesh is put in, and we become new. We're no longer dead. Now we're alive. Chime in anytime you want, Corey. Uh, repentance is that uh, change of mind that changes our life. So it's a change of heart, truly, where we turn from living our life our way, and we turn to God. It's that about face of, of, of a mind and heart where we turn to God and regener and, and what we hold is regeneration will always precede, come before faith and repentance. Because since we're dead in our sin, we would never come to Christ unless God does a work of plucking out, of, of making our heart new. And so regenerate we're born again repentance and faith, uh, and, and there now we're converted. We're trusting in Christ alone. We've turned from our sins. That doesn't mean we quit sinning, but we've turned from living life our way. We've given our lives to God and uh, because we've been born again, and now we're converted. And when we're converted, conversion, now God says, you are, he declares us righteous. We're justified. Justification. All right? Are we okay so far? See, the theologian over here, I got to make sure that... Uh, and, and we're adopted into the family of God. No, 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 no. And I'm not making fun of Corey because... <laughs> But he is in the process. He's in, he's, he's live study right now, you know. I'm, I'm not, anyway. And then we're set apart. So in one sense, when we're born again, we repent, we put our faith in Christ, we're uh, converted. Uh, God declares us righteous. He doesn't make us righteous Yet, I mean, in a sense, he's given us the spirit. We're alive. But we're set apart now to be used by him. We were sanctified when we were saved. But we're also being sanctified in that process of sanctification that uh, where we're being made righteous by God uh, as spiritual growth. We study the word. We're filled with the spirit. We yield ourselves to the power of the Spirit, and we become more like Christ as we go. There's another, the sanctification is a doctrine of salvation. Perseverance of the saints. If you're a saint, if you're truly a Christian, you will persevere to the end. Uh, because God will preserve you to the end. He will keep you to the end. So there's another doctrine of uh, salvation and, of course, glorification when we're raised to, to, and made like Christ when we see him as he is. 
glorification is the future aspect of our salvation. What else, Corey? Anything to add to this controversy that I caused? <laughs> I just was looking at John 3. and um, Okay, John 3, it's good. It's pretty amazing that it teaches, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, which he's still talking to him in verse 16 as, as, as we go on, but Jesus is teaching regeneration, faith, and repentance all here. I mean, it's interesting because he talks about the necessity of being born again. Then he talks about whoever believes in him should not perish. And then he talks about whoever does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should expose him. And it's just talking about, I mean, so we see you must be born again. You must believe. Whoever believes is saved. And then it talks about, I mean, it's implied that those works, those who continue in the works of darkness are not, they, they do not love the light, haven't come to the light. And so Jesus is teaching all of those elements right there. I think that's, it's, it's interesting. I think the reason we miss it, I miss it, is because I block 16 through 21 in my Bible as another thing happening there. A whole instead different. Of, yeah, okay. instead of him still talking there. But he teaches all of those, and it's uh, amazing uh, to see that. And Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, right? He was the teacher. He held three offices that nobody else in Scripture held as a, as the teacher of the Jewish faith, and yet Jesus says, you got to be born again, mm -hmm. Nick. You're, uh, uh, you're not a believer. And so we talk about three aspects of saving faith mm -hmm. from Calvin. Mm -hmm. Three aspects. Of, you got to know the gospel. you got to know what the gospel is. you got to know who you are before God. Mm -hmm. And so you, got, you know the gospel. Then you have to agree that this gospel is true. But even then you're not saved. Hmm. It's not saving faith until the truth of the gospel penetrates your heart and you trust in Christ as your only hope. Hmm. So I hope you are saved by God, trusting in Christ alone. Now you're being sanctified and made like Him. Looking forward to the day when we'll see Christ Jesus face to face and we'll become like him because we'll see him as he is, as John says. Anything else? You got a comment or a question? It's your chance. Chapter 4, 34 to 37. Can we take anything about Nebuchadnezzar's spiritual state from this? Or is, it, is there redemption or is it just outward praise? Well, in 2 and 3 for sure, it's just outward praise that didn't last, right? He, he, he went right back into his own self-absorbed ways. Chapter 30, verse 37 of chapter 4 ends praising God. So we don't have the rest of the story. But... If you really examine the first three verses of chapter 4, which is his conclusion that he puts at the front and then says essentially the same thing in those last four verses, he says things differently than he said them in, two, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 as God confronted him and he really did not repent. It, it, there's evidence that he was truly converted right there but God, in his wisdom, didn't tell us anymore. <laughs> Does that help, David? I mean, it, it seems to me he's converted. But if he is, then he lived out his years uh, faithful. Anything else? Come to Christ now before God's mercy runs out. Can we really say that God's mercy runs out? Uh, well, his, his mercy ran out for Nebuchadnezzar and he went out in the field, right, and, and acted like an animal, but God restored him. So, does God's mercy run out? God's mercy, uh, yes. But, I mean, that's his mystery. 
That, that's, that's the secret things that we don't know for me to, or for someone we have. You, surely you have loved ones. Is there a point when they've heard the gospel enough and God will not? His mercy runs out there. His mercy is why they're still alive in their rejection of Christ. Will his, will, will his mercy run out and will he just j bring judgment upon them? Uh, that's, that's God's business. As long as they're alive, they can come to Christ. So we pray for them, we plead with them, we hope uh, for them and leave those things that God has not told us about to him, knowing that he's always going to do what's right. Good question, though, James. Anyone else? You're in a close, Corey. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do. We come before you as we conclude our time together and as we are reminded that you owe us nothing, but yet you give us everything in Christ. And so I pray that this night, that if there are those who are here, who hear of Christ, who hear of our need for Christ, that that person, those people would, would come running to you through the blood, by the blood of Christ. Because we do know that you will not be patient with us forever. And for those who are outside of Christ, there will come a day a day that we all cannot fathom or a day that we all do not, that none of us want to see. And so, Father, I pray for mercy and grace. We do pray that your mercy and grace would be multiplied to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.